The Jerusalem Channel is made possible by viewer support. Thanks for watching. Jerusalem is always inspiring to visit during the Jewish holidays, and the biblical Feast of Tabernacles is coming up in October. Join us in the City of the Great King for five nights of joyful celebration. Exploits Ministry has planned a special tour package, including participation with thousands of Israelis and guests from all over the world in the annual Jerusalem March. So bring your flags, banners, and walking shoes. We'll also explore many of the ancient wonders and spiritual highlights around the city. And we'll have times of feasting and celebration. So plan now to come up to Jerusalem and join our Exploits Ministry Tour, October 16 to 21. For details, visit our website, jerusalemchannel.tv. Can you sense the presence of God in a very special way when you're in the Holy Land? Well, I believe you can. And that's one reason why I encourage everyone to come on a pilgrimage to Israel. And there's a Jewish sage who lived in the Middle Ages who felt the same way about this sacred land. His name was Yehuda Halevi. He taught that the Shekinah, the presence and glory of God, was still connected with the Holy Land in a very special way, and that Jewish people would never really regain their prophetic abilities until they return home. Shalom, I'm Christine Darg, the medieval poet and philosopher Yehuda HaLevi who lived in Spain during the Muslim occupation of the Middle Ages, is considered one of the greatest Hebrew poets because of the beauty of his hymns and also because his life's vision was making Aliyah, returning to Zion. Yehuda HaLevi lived during the Jewish Golden Age in the city of Granada, Spain, and he was far ahead of his time in his vision of a Messianic age. Like many of today's Orthodox Jews, he had a burning desire for Messianic redemption. Although he lived centuries before the modern state of Israel was miraculously reborn, Yehuda HaLevi's yearning for Zion is immortalized in the popular song, Jerusalem of Gold, which has become something like Israel's second national anthem. The song is so beloved in Israel that it's considered an alternative to the national anthem, Hatikva, the hope. Well, in Granada, Spain, situated at the foot of the snow-capped Sierra Nevada mountains, Yehuda HaLevi refused to become assimilated, although at that time the Jews had their own state that peacefully coexisted with the Islamic Moors wandering through the streets and cosmos of the Andalusian cities like Granada, today's visitor may wonder what these cities were like over 900 years ago when sizable Jewish populations walked the picturesque streets. Granada was the main center of Jewish literary and intellectual life, but the apparent good life in Spain was no promised land to Yehuda HaLevi since to him, God was absent. You see, some spiritual people are much more attuned than others to the atmospheric presence or absence of God in a place. And although God's Shekinah presence appeared to be missing from the Holy Land, in truth, Yehuda HaLevi strongly believed that God's presence could still be sensed in the land of Israel. And for sure that's true. I'll never forget the surprise that I received when I visited Jerusalem for the first time. I was amazed how the presence of God permeates the atmosphere, even in places that most people think would be secular. Of course, not everybody senses this, and it's a subjective thing. But nevertheless, I've become convinced that spirit-filled Bible believers have a spiritual barometer, as it were, 
for sensing the presence of God in the atmospheric pressure. Well, Yehuda Halevi knew he had to leave Spain and get back to Zion, where God's presence still lingered. He longed even to taste the dust of Zion. So he begged God somehow to be transported on eagle's wings to see what his heart was telling him. And the stronger his yearning became for Zion, the more he realized that the Garden of Spain was actually a desert. It held no attraction for him. And at the same time, he realized that Zion's desert was a garden that held everything that he longed for. And as happens with so many people who are called by God to leave the land of their birth, he wrote with brave honesty that he feared and trembled with tears to leave Spain, but he placed his spirit in the hand of the winds to be carried to the east. The sage wasn't oblivious to the glories of the golden age in Spain, but they had simply lost their hold on him. With true missionary vision, Yehuda Halevi wrote that it's a light thing to leave all the good things of Spain in order to behold the dust of the desolate sanctuary. He wrote that he was drawn to the Holy Land where the Shekinah glory abides within. And he said, and I love this line, the land is full of gates. He was referring to portals such as Jacob experienced at Bethel with angels ascending and descending upon a ladder. Well, Spain and the other nations had a lot going for them, opportunities and temporary safe havens for the Jews, but only as long as persecution was restrained. Ultimately, the Jews were expelled in 1492. The Alhambra decree brought Spanish Jewish life to a sudden end. But Yehudah Halevi had already come to the conclusion that Zion had more to offer. After all, he said, the Shekinah, God's presence, had never been in Spain. Quoting the Bible, he wrote, God hath desired Zion for a dwelling place, and happy is the man whom he chooses and brings near. Well, Yehuda's mentor in Granada had been the famous Moses Ibn Ezra, the writer of penitential prayers. And many of Ibn Ezra's more than 200 sacred compositions are found in the traditional Jewish prayer books for the high holy days. His poems of repentance are known as Shlichot in Hebrew. Yehuda HaLevi's mentor was one of the powerful Sephardic masters. And the word Sephardic, by the way, is referenced by the prophet Obadiah in the Bible and refers to Spain. In fact, Obadiah 1.20 says that the exiles from Jerusalem who are in Safarad will possess the towns of the Negev. That's a prophetic reference to Sephardic Jews who will return to possess the Holy Land. Yehuda HaLevi was a very early forerunner of the Sephardic returnees. Today, many Sephardic Jews from the Iberian Peninsula are dwelling in the Holy Land, and we've been so privileged to see much Bible prophecy coming to pass in our lifetime. Well, the Sephardic B'nai Anusim, meaning children of the coerced Spanish Jews, is a modern term used to define the contemporary descendants of the estimated quarter of a million Sephardic Jews who were forced to convert to Catholicism during the 14th and 15th century. Although, as I said, the Jews were expelled from Spain by the Catholic monarchs in 1492, the vast majority of the Jews who had been coerced into Christianity remained in Spain and Portugal. Their descendants today number in the millions. And guess what? They're waking up to their Hebrew roots, and many of them feel drawn, just like Yehuda HaLevi, to return to the Holy Land. Yehuda's poems and liturgical songs went as far as India and influenced the rituals of distant countries. Even the Kararite Jews, who were strict scripturalists, incorporated some of his songs into their prayer book. So there is scarcely a synagogue where Yehuda HaLevi's songs are not sung. 
although his impassioned call to his contemporaries to return to Zion was received for the most part with indifference, his own decision to go to Jerusalem never wavered. His words sound very contemporary. He asked, can we hope for any refuge where Jews can dwell safely except in the land of the Bible? And although he occupied an honored position in Spain as a physician, intellectual, and community leader, his religious convictions compelled him to go to the land of Israel. I wonder how many watching this program have felt a similar compulsion whether you're Jewish or a born-again Christian, you're missing a great revelation in life if you haven't beheld the land of the Bible for yourself. And Yehuda Halevi knew this intuitively. He famously wrote, My heart is in the East, but I am at the end of the West. So rejecting Granada's Jewish-Arab hybrid culture, he departed for Israel in the year 1140 visiting Alexandria and Cairo along the way, but refusing to tarry in Egypt. Eventually, he made it to Zion. It was the burning dream that it kept him alive, but he died shortly after arriving in 1141 in the Promised Land, which at that time was called the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem. So was all of his effort in vain to die just upon arrival? I don't think so. Even today, there are streets named in his honor, both in the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem's old city and also in the city of Tel Aviv. You see, Yehuda HaLevi achieved his goal and inspired many others through the centuries. In his writings, he had expressed strong desire just to breathe the air of the Holy Land, to walk barefoot amongst her desolate ruins in the paths of God's ark where once the temples had stood and where the cherubim had dwelt. He wanted his tears to fall like the dew of Hermon upon Jerusalem's holy hill. And admirably, he yearned to pour out his soul in the same place where the Spirit of God was outpoured upon his people. In his poignant poem to Jerusalem, Yehuda HaLevi wrote, from the western coast, my desire burns toward thee. Pity and tenderness burst within me, remembering thy former glories, thy temple, now broken stones. I wish I could fly to thee on wings of an eagle and mingle my tears with thy dust. I have sought thee, love, though the king is not there. And instead of Gilead's balm, snakes and scorpions, let me fall on thy broken stones and tenderly kiss them. The taste of thy dust will be sweeter than honey. That poem reminds me of Psalm 102, verse 14, which says, Thy servants take pleasure in Zion's stones and love her dust. Well, undoubtedly, Yehuda HaLevi is said to have been the first thinker to propose a systematic, comprehensive philosophy of the land of Israel. In his book, the Sefer HaKuzari, he dealt with the unique status of God's land. One of his book's main themes was the absence of prophecy in the diaspora, the nations where the Jews were dispersed. He mourned the lack of powerful prophecy as it was known in biblical times. He contended that a Jewish person can only become a prophet when connected with the land of the Bible. However, he believed that a remnant of the prophet's powers of illumination remained upon the Jews in the form of inspiration. And he believed that each Jewish soul has the ability to manifest prophetic insight. And I agree. I've certainly noticed inherent inspirational insights in my interactions with Jewish people, as well as with their half-brothers, the Arabs. So many of them, Jews and Arabs, possess a poetic and prophetic turn of phrases. I believe Yehuda HaLevi's assessment was true about prophetic inspiration remaining upon the Jewish people at large. How else can one account for the dynamic 
charismatic leaders who sprung up in the diaspora, often with gifts of the Holy Spirit, and whose religious movements have kept the Jewish people cohesive and in touch with the Almighty, despite their wanderings, despite the pogroms and persecutions. Although Yehuda HaLevi decried the loss of the prophetic gift, nevertheless, the early Zionists treated his poems and hymns like sacred prophecies. He contended that both the land of Israel and the people of Israel are intrinsically holy and set apart to fulfill God's special purpose. And the New Testament teaches that's certainly true. God is far from finished with Israel. He's determined to restore their kingdom in the last days when Jesus returns to sit on the throne of his ancestral father, King David. Yehuda HaLevi said that the Jewish people are endowed because of their righteous ancestors with a special eternal nature, setting them apart from other nations. And the Apostle Paul said the same thing in Romans eleven twenty eight, that as far as election is concerned, they are beloved on account of the patriarchs. Like so many Jews living in Western nations today, Yehuda HaLevi doubted the future security of the Jewish people in the diaspora. He arrived at the conviction shared by many religious Jews today that true fulfillment is possible only in the presence of the God of Israel, which he believed, of course, was most palpable in the land of Israel. Even though he lived in the golden age of Sephardic Judaism, nevertheless, Yehuda HaLevi sensed then what's happening again now. He foresaw political fanaticism emerging in the nations, and he believed that a peaceful Jewish life was only possible in the land of Israel. And isn't that the conclusion of many Jewish people in the West right now? Persecution, uneasiness in the nations is sending them home. Well, Yehuda HaLevi died a seemingly untimely death, but his legacy became far-reaching. The text of the Jewish national anthem, Hatikva, meaning the hope, basically contains sentiments expressed centuries earlier by Yehuda HaLevi. Hatikva was written by an immigrant named Naphtali Ember, and the official text is relatively short. In fact, it's only a single complex sentence saying, as long as within the heart the Jewish soul yearns towards the ends of the East and I still gazes towards Zion, our hope is not yet lost. The hope 2,000 years old to be a free nation in our land, the land of Zion and Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The phrase, our hope is not yet lost, is a biblical allusion to Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones in Ezekiel 37, 11, a verse which says, Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off from being a nation, describing the despair of the Jewish people in exile and the Holocaust. But God promises to redeem them, to open their graves and to lead them back to the land of Israel. And by the grace of God, Yehuda HaLevi knew in the Middle Ages that the Jewish hope wasn't finished, that the sanctuary would not remain desolate forever. He nourished that hope to return to the land of his fathers, to the city where David had lived. So now listen to this. One of his poems, Yehuda HaLevi, also wrote this. He asked Zion, do you ask if the captives are at peace? I cry out like the jackals when I think of the captives' grief. I dream of the end of their captivity. I am like a harp for your songs. Well, those immortal words, I am like a harp for your songs, were included in the now famous Israeli song, Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, Jerusalem of Gold written in 1967 by Naomi Shemer. Jerusalem of Gold became an unofficial second national anthem after Israel miraculously won the Six-Day War. Yehuda HaLevi had said he was like a harp for Zion's songs, and the author of Jerusalem of Gold put his metaphor into her lyrics 
using the word kinor. She wrote in Hebrew, I need kinor, I am a harp, for all of Zion's songs. The kinor was an ancient Israelite musical instrument mentioned in the Bible, generally translated as harp or lyre. Its imagery is associated with the type of harp played by King David. And kinor has subsequently come to mean violin in modern Hebrew. Many of the lyrics of Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, Jerusalem of Gold, refer to deep yearning for Zion. Naomi Shimmer's lyrics are laced with mournful biblical references to Jerusalem's destruction and the exile of the Jewish people. Her aim was to weave together both biblical references and traditional Jewish poetry. For example, in the first stanza, the city that sits alone is lifted from the opening verse of the book of Lamentations. And the phrase, if I forget thee, Jerusalem, is a quote from Psalm 137. At the time her song was first written, the old city of Jerusalem was still under Jordanian occupation. Jews had been banned from the old city in East Jerusalem becoming refugees, losing their homes and possessions, and many holy sites were desecrated, destroyed, or damaged during that period. But only three weeks after the song was published, the Six-Day War began, and the tune became a morale-boosting battle cry of the army. Shemer herself had sung it for the troops before the war like an elegy, because no one at that time was able to visit the Temple Mount in the Old City. But on June 5, 1967, only three weeks after the song was published, the Six-Day War began and the lyrics would soon need to be updated. On the third day of the war, June 7, Israeli paratroopers regained the Temple Mount and the song Jerusalem of Gold burst from their lips. The song was just a natural expression of 2,000 years of yearning for that moment. They had finally recaptured the heart of Zion. Although the state of Israel was officially reestablished in 1948, the moment that Jewish sovereignty was regained in Jerusalem, that was the moment that Israelis believed they were finally home. So after the reunification of Jerusalem, songwriter Naomi Shemer felt that her ballad required additional words. She wrote a new ending, turning the hymn into a song of triumph. Shimmer added a verse about Jerusalem's reunification. The new words countered the haunting phrases of lamentation in the former verses. Now she wrote about a ram's horn calling out on the Temple Mount, and this referred to actual events of June the 7th, 1967, when the army's rabbi, Shlomo Gurn, blew his shofar. In fact, Rabbi Gorin was on the scene during the recapture of East Jerusalem on the 7th of June. He gave an emotional prayer of thanksgiving, famously broadcast live to the entire nation. Blowing a shofar and carrying a Torah scroll, Rabbi Gorin held the first Jewish prayer session at the Western Wall since 1948. The event was one of the defining moments of the war, and several photographs of Rabbi Gorin surrounded by soldiers in prayer, have become famous around the world and particularly in Israel. And the most famous photograph shows Rabbi Gorin blowing his ram's horn against the background of the Western Wall. Well, it's important now for me to take a moment to say that after the Six-Day War, world opinion was still largely supportive of Israel. The Holocaust was still fresh in the minds of people and the Six-Day War was viewed as a miracle of biblical proportions like little David defeating the giant Goliath. But instead of rebuilding their temple, Israeli leadership had a lapse of faith then, and they gave the Palestinian leadership time to begin rewriting the narrative, calling Israel's rebirth the Nakba, an Arabic word meaning catastrophe. And that narrative has been gaining momentum because after all, the Nazis taught Israel's enemies that if you say a lie often enough, people will eventually believe it. And it's true that many Palestinians suffered and continued to suffer because the Jews have a Jewish state. 
But it wasn't a catastrophe because many Jewish people in the 20th century were expelled from their homes in Arabic lands, up to 800,000 Jews. But mercifully, there was finally a Jewish state to absorb them. So the world must recognize that two people are suffering in the current conflict, both Jews and Arabs. There's a troubling new form of anti-Semitism, and it's called anti-Zionism, opposing the return of the Jewish people to Zion. But their return is biblical. God himself favors the return of the Jewish people at this time. The whole scenario in the Middle East reminds me of Jesus' parable of the returning prodigal son. So it requires much grace, patience, and ultimately revelation from the Spirit of God for the Arabs to welcome home their brothers, the Jews. And it requires Israelis being careful to administer justice towards their Arab brethren. Nevertheless, the movement of Zionism has an end-time momentum that no politician and no terrorist can stop. Even Satan will try to destroy Israel again and again, but he will fail because of the return of King Messiah, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus, Yeshua. As Revelation 5.5 proclaims, the Lion from the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has already won the victory, and he's already prophetically emblazoned on the flag of Jerusalem. He will soon return to rule this world that needs him so desperately. So in the meantime, I want to encourage anybody watching or listening to this to sing the songs of Zion like Yehuda Halevi did long ago. Songs of Zion express the yearning of the Jewish people to see with their natural eyes the hill of Zion and the city of Jerusalem once again shining in all its former glory. Also, one of my very favorite Psalm 84 in verse 5 tells us that a blessed individual has the highways to Zion in his or her heart. And those on the highways to Zion make the valley of weeping a spring. That Psalm says that we're going to go from strength to strength. So today, I want to invite those who have a desire to visit the Holy Land at least once to dare to come with us on our special Insiders Tours. For anybody who has a longing to walk in the footsteps of the prophets and the Lord Jesus, I want to borrow a prayer from Yehuda HaLevi. And he prayed, Oh, be a help unto the servant who has faith and who hastens to behold the places of thy wonder. Amen. And I want to emphasize hasten because coming with us is not something to put off indefinitely. And I also encourage people to bring their children because just walking this land makes a deep impression on young people's souls. And in the meantime, I want to encourage all of you that our videos for your strengthening and edification are available 24 hours a day at our website, exploits.tv. Our teachings are available to strengthen your faith. And you can also click online to receive our free color magazine, Exploits, based upon Daniel 11.32. That verse declares that the people who know their God will be strong and take action, carrying out exploits. In other words, we're going to accomplish the works of the Lord in our generation. You'll also find details of our life-changing Holy Land tours and prayer conferences at our website. We lead those tours to Israel at least three times a year, and they're so much fun and life-changing. So let's stay in touch through the social media, and don't forget to invite your friends to watch our programs and to download our Jerusalem Channel app. And so until next time, always contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem, I'm Christine Dark. Shalom and Maranatha. All aboard! We're on the little train that goes from Jerusalem's Jaffa Gate and weaves through the sacred old city down to the Western Wall to pray. And we want to invite you to come along and support us financially so that the Jerusalem Channel can continue to move in the presence of God throughout this old city. 
and throughout this nation. Thank you for supporting us, and we invite you to go to the donate page of our website, JerusalemChannel.tv. God bless you out of Zion.